Hi everyone, my name is Sanya Kule. I'm a teaching assistant for advanced bioinformatics and today I want to talk to you guys about um, the Cochrane Armitage um, trend test statistic that is applied for a genome wide association study. So um, the general application will be in statistical genetics and bioinformatics, but we're sort of talking about a location in the genome, a single nucleotide polymorphism for a given gene and there are two, uh, two different, uh, three different um, genotypes that we've observed for two different alleles. And is there a, a relationship between um, those gene genotypes and the observed phenotypes of disease or being healthy in our population. So sort of bridging it between our genotype and our observed phenotype using a linear trend here, which is um, kind of captured over here. So um, in the spirit, I just want to start off making it nice and light, you know, but uh, this is a, an example of a gene. He's like, la, 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 la. And this guy's like, yeah, I know it's weird, but this is how they express themselves. I know this is weird, but this is how they express themselves. So I just think like, DNA is exciting, and so is this study and um, this application, and it has a lot of practical implications. So let's get started. And along the way, guys, please, please, please let me know if you have any questions at all. I'll be really happy to help. Um, and again, this is a Cochrane Armitage test for a genome-wide association study. So a lot of times we sort of wonder, well, why are we observing a certain phenotype in the population? You know, um, why are we observing that um, some of these dogs, for instance, have like um, like this yellow coating on them, uh, or, like, or yellow fur, brownish fur, and other dogs just have white fur, for instance. Like, why are we observing these phenotypes? So one of the things that we can do, you know, when we're thinking, why is this the case, you know, it's like the smiley here, is we can perform a forward genetic screen, you know, such as the genome-wide association study, to try to identify genetic variants that can be associated with the observed phenotypes. And genetic variants can include all sorts of things, along the genome, you know, so if 23 pairs of chromosomes, one from each parent of ours, and we want to figure out what could be associated because our genes ultimately are responsible in some way for the phenotypes that we observe. You know, genes lead, uh, many genes, um, um, mo the most are non-protein coding, but, you know, we have genes and then they encode proteins, and we want to figure out the functionality um, of those and, and how can they be associated with the phenotype that we are actually interested in. So usually we have these genome-wide association studies or we call them GWAS. You can think of this as like Inspector Gadget, you know, kind of scanning the whole genome. So what is a genome-wide association study? So these studies involve scanning markers across the genomes of many people to find genetic variations that are associated with a particular disease. So which individuals, um, you know, have a phenotype in a population? And of those individuals, um, what kinds of genes do they have that, that could be associated with the disease in general? That's what we're, we're trying to look for. Um, so pretty much in a genome-wide association study, we rapidly scan markers across the complete set of DNA or genomes of many people to find genetic variations associated with a particular disease. Once new genetic associations are identified, researchers can use the information to develop better strategies to detect, treat, and prevent the disease. So we can find, you know, what kind of genetic variants, what genes um, about along the loci of different chromosomes could be associated with the different phenotypes that we are observing. So that's what we try to do with GWAS studies. So look within the chromosome information, try to find markers of genetic um, markers of the disease that we're interested in. So here, um, the, the disease, the application of interest for this problem is going to be type 1 diabetes. So type 1 diabetes, also known as juvenile diabetes. So you can see this poor little girl over here. Um, so what's happened is she has a um, destroyed pancreatic cells. They cannot produce insulin. So it's very, very unfortunate. So it's a chronic condition in which the pancreas produces little to no insulin. So it typically appears in adolescence and um, symptoms include increased thirst, having to go to the bathroom a lot, um, hunger, fatigue, blurred vision, and treatment is aimed at maintaining normal blood sugar levels through regular monitoring, insulin therapy, diet, and exercise. 
So it's, it's quite rare, but there's type 2 diabetes, which my uh, my late grandma had. Um, she had late, um, um, she had type 2 diabetes, and I miss her every day. So she's my maternal grandma, so I call her Nani. So that's her. And that's my older sister. I call her Didi, my younger brother, Arman. So note I bolded the arm because we're talking about the arm metrage test. So I just remember my brother. That's me as a pipsqueak. But it's my it's my grandma and um you know that she had diabetes complications. So I miss her every day. It's a story that's very personal to me as well, Miss Yunani. Um so pretty much with type um, diabetes in general, you can have like urinary, urinary tract infections, surgical site infections, yeast infections, foot infections. So it's just very unfortunate to prick the finger as well. It's, it's a very unfortunate disease. And today we're just trying to focus more on the application will be type 1 diabetes in the end as well. We're trying to figure out if a certain you know, variant that we have found in this position, is it have some um, connection association with the probability that we um, a person will have um, type 1 diabetes. That, that's what our application of interest here. Miss Yunani. So genome-wide association studies have um, looked in type 2 diabetes, for instance, they've tried to find a risk variance that could be associated with um, type 2 diabetes. And you can see here that recently they've been looking in type 1 diabetes, tried to discover associations right now that are currently weak. Um, you know, this is about like a, a few years back. Um, and they're looking at different risk loci that could be associated with type 1 diabetes. So what we find from these genome-wide association studies are these single nucleotide polymorphisms. So what are they? They're pretty much the most common type of genetic variant. So kind of imagine, you know, Buzz Lightyear telling Woody, you know, single nucleotide polymorphism. They're everywhere. So it's basically a change of one DNA base in one location of the genome. Like see here, for instance, we can see an A, a G, and a T. Um, and they are basically one spot along the genome. A lot of people have variation in that spot. Pretty much almost like 99% of our DNA with other humans is almost pretty much identical. Um, but they're kind of like a, a few hundred thousand DNA bases of ours that can differ. But um, what's important is that SNPs usually are like, they are really frequently um, different between certain groups in the population. Um, and it's just one change of a DNA base at a specific spot in the genome. So you can imagine that she has um, a G in that location whereas this other person has a C in that location as well. So just a change of one DNA base in a location of the genome. Um, and that could lead to um, different alleles of the same gene. So let's suppose that we want to look at type 1 diabetes, you know, this juvenile diabetes, and we're looking at the population A. So it's some subset here in the population around the world that we, we're interested in, maybe just some, some group or, or something, you know, we're trying to measure it. Um, so we're trying to figure out, okay, well, we have calculated the um, genotype expression of individuals in population A at a particular SNP, the single nucleotide polymorphism. So we found that, you know, um, we've, we've calculated it. We found, you know, 28 people have CC here and they have the disease. 95 people have CC, but they have, um, they don't have the disease so their controls. Um, so, so basically the most important thing is the first part is it's like a case control. So this is the case, the people with the, the type 1 diabetes, the disease, and here is the control. These are the individuals who do not have the disease. And we found three main genotypes. Um, individuals have a C and a C, so one from mom and one from dad, or a C and a G, or a G and a G. And this is the breakdown of the of the different um, you know, genotypes for those individuals. And these are the phenotypes over here. So pretty much like the way that you can um, think about this is the following, where, um, let me try to write this. Well, right here, this is the um, pheno. And the top is the geno. And because it's case control, um, so this is the total number of people with CC allele. So um, we could think of like 
um, when you have a chromosome and we're looking at a specific spot along this chromosome. And then we have one from um, the same chromosome, sorry, like bad at drawing, um, mom. And then we have it from dad. Oh, thanks. And then we're looking here in this in this specific spot here for the mom. And then let's say that in the dad, it could be it could if it's the same, it would be the C and the C. For instance, or maybe it could be different. Maybe it could just be like like it could be orange instead for the dad. In this case, it would be like a, a C and a G. This would be a G then. So we're trying to, or it could be a G and a G. Maybe this is also like, uh, mom's also a G, for instance. And the same is true the other way around as well, where, you know, the like either or um, is possible, either combination is possible. So what we're trying to do is we have this case, and then we have this control information and this phenotype and genotype information for these individuals. So again, this is what I was sort of mentioning that um, we have CC and now we find these at uh, the SNP here. This guy's analyzing what are the common genotypes that we found so we can have a CC, so both C alleles from parents. We can have a CG, which um, means like one C from one parent could be mom or dad and then one G from the other parent and a GG, so both G alleles from parents. So these are the different um, like genotypes that we observe and the associated phenotypes. So um, if we take 28 plus 95, that would be 123. So we have 123 individuals with CC, and then we observe this breakdown of individuals with the disease and the control. So we, we can try to say, is there some sort of connection between this genotype and the phenotype? Do, do the, any of these three groups seem likelier to have the disease than the other group? So that's the main question we're focusing on. So is there an association between the genotype of the single nucleotide polymorphism at this location in the in the um, chromosome. And remember, we always have two of them because we want from each parent. Um, so we could look at CC, CG, and or GG. If we look at the genotype and the disease status within the population, does having one genotype make you likely to have the disease, um, type one diabetes in this case, than the other? That's what we're trying to say. Is there some association? Is there some sort of a connection that we will then have to investigate further? That's what we're trying to do. Like, so the main question again is, is there an association between the genotype of this SNP? And here we have three genotypes and the disease status within the population A. So on this slide are two of my favorite um, movies uh, kind of uh, as well, like one of them is Inspector Gadget. My brother uh, loved this movie. He grew up, he really, really loved this movie, Inspector Gadget. And then the emoji movie. Um, but generally, let's just zoom in with our binoculars and see that inside a cell, we have um, 23 pairs of chromosomes. And um, for each chromosome, um, we get one copy from each of our parents, so one copy from mom, one copy from dad. And so let's imagine we're just looking inside a chromosome and we're just studying the DNA, um, you know, like so. So inside um, the chromosome, it's DNA that's tightly wound together to form a chromosome. It's really tightly, tightly packed. And then what we're looking at is we're looking in a specific location inside it and we're looking at a particular SNP that maybe one person or on one chromosome, for instance, um, you know, it, instead of being an A, it's instead it's a G, you know, maybe the person has some, um, so in this case, maybe what we would look at is like, you know, if this person has an A, then like we're looking at CC, CG, uh, GG. So basically we're looking in, in one location, for instance, and seeing like what if that basis changed something um, like here it could be like a, a change from an A to a G like let's say that the alleles could be an A or a G so an AA um, so basically the alleles could look like um, AA AG or GG for instance and if this person um, has in this situation an A instead of a G how does that um, change? Does that make you likelier? You know, the person has an A and an A. Um, does it, they have a, a likelier um, like chance of them being um, healthier or, you know, are they likely to be diseased? 
But like, what is it exactly? So then we could look like, what if it's A and G instead? Like, what if they actually have one chromosome like this and the other chromosome like this from each parent? Um, then does that have an impact on what we observe? Or what if it's both of these G and G as well? What if it's this? So we're basically looking in this particular location. So we're looking in this chromosome and this location, and we're looking at the chrom one chromosome and then the other chromosome from the other parent and in the same location. And we're trying to analyze exactly uh, this mutation and trying to figure out like this SNP and figure out is this associated, this is genotype of the SNP, is it associated with the phenotype that we have observed, like if we're healthy, if we're in the control group, or we are in the disease group, if we're unhealthy. That's what we're trying to say. Is there an association? Does this SNP make that much of an impact or, or have that kind of an association? We can't say if it causes it. We can say if it's associated with it. Like if there's some sort of connection, but we don't really know what it is. But if that if there's something that we need to investigate there further, like, you know, um, you know, looking in there further. So is the genotype associated with the observed phenotype, the genotype at this location? That's what we're trying to do. And to note that we can test this association um, between our um, observed um, phenotype and our genotype that we have observed at this particular location along the genome with um, two of the main methods. Uh, one is the Pearson's chi-square test. And, and please see my other video where I talk about um, this um, method over here. Um, and the other one is the Armitage test or the Cochrane Armitage test that we are um, going to talk about today. So that's going to be really exciting as well. And they both are trying to figure out, OK, well, how can we determine, you know, there's an association between our um, genotype in a specific um, location of the genome and the phenotype that we end up observing? So um, please note that here we can take an Armitage test uh, to determine if there is a linear trend in the phenotype proportions in the disease status across the different genotypes in population A. So, um, so we're trying to figure out, is there a linear trend? Is there some sort of association between having the genotype of a, of a CC, a CG, or a GG and our disease status? So in probability terms, what this is saying is, um, you know, this is the probability of the phenotype is equal to type 1 diabetes disease, given that we have population A genotype of um, CC. So that's how we interpret this. So it's this probability given that we have this. So given that we have this information, so the mapping is saying that given that we already have population A genotype, so if we have a given genotype, what is this corresponding probability that we're going to have the disease? And what the null hypothesis, this is our status quo, this is what we currently believe is true, is that there is no linear trend. There is no association. That's a status quo. That's a default belief. So basically, the probability of the disease in population A is not linear in the number of one of the alleles. I mean, there's no connection at all. Um, that means that, you know, the probability you're going to have the disease is going to stay the same whether you have population A genotype, um, whether you have popula uh, of, of CC, whether you have the CG genotype, so one from, um, you know, C is from one parent, G is from the other parent, or whether you have both G alleles from the other parent, your probability of having that disease phenotype will remain the same. That's sort of what the null hypothesis is, is, um, is saying, is that the probability is going to remain the same. And here our p-value that we're using is 0.05. So we reject the null hypothesis if um, the p-value for this Armitage test will be less than our p-value threshold of 0.05. So then we're going to reject the null and go for the alternative hypothesis. In our alternative hypothesis, there is a linear trend. So when you typically see like there's no linear trend, it, it looks like when we have these correlations, and um and it's like there's almost like there's no correlation. It's all like just a bunch of points, you know, just scattered throughout. You know, we're not able to find any sort of trend. That that's sort of what we are um, what we are referring to. That we have just like just a bunch of random, you know, points. It's just no trend at all. And that's like almost there's no association. We can't fit any trend to it. And then for the alternative hypothesis, 
there is a linear trend. So it's like two sided in, in a way where we have like where we can have like maybe like let's say there's like a positive trend. Then we can probably fit some sort of line that's not like um you know that's not like zero. So here we probably like our best bet might be just something like you know just like a random line going through that's like the best bet um but here for the alternative hypothesis there is a linear trend that is the probability of the disease in the population a is linear in the number of one of the alleles that means that maybe if we have um maybe here we have both cc alleles here we have one c allele and then here we have zero c alleles does that have any link with the disease or conversely we have zero um g alleles one g allele in cg and two g alleles here and the, does that number of you know c alleles or the number of g alleles does that impact the probability that we have the disease so we look at the probability of having the disease phenotype again given a certain genotype so again what this bar is saying is this bar uh, the way whenever you see a bar the way that you can interpret it is it just means given that so this is like this information again it's always like a map like given that this happened what's this probability and um you know so what we're saying is that not all of these probabilities are the same so this thing above is saying that it does make a difference here this is saying it does make a difference what your genotype is because these are not equal not equal so this is a two-sided test here that you know if you have the genotype of cc the probability you have the disease is going to be different than it would be if you're, um, you know, like what's the phenotype um, of the disease phenotype probability given that your genotype is CG, that's going to be also different than the probability that you have the disease phenotype given that you have the genotype of GG, that's all going to be different. Um, it's not going to be the same. But in the null hypothesis, we say that all these probabilities, if you're having the disease, are the same regardless of what your genotype is. If it's CC, CG, or GG, it really doesn't make a difference. So that's why they're all equal. So that's our null hypothesis, and that's our alternative hypothesis to saying that there is some trend between the genotype and the phenotype. So like what you could write here would be like the genotype. And then this would be this mapping would be pheno. So, so that's how you interpret it. So here again, um, what we are interested in is that the fact that the probabilities are not all the same. So if we had multiple classes, so here we have just these three groups, you know, there's three phenotypes of CC, CG, and GG. So we have multiple groups and we are thinking that, you know, that the one is that there is some linear trend. We just don't know which one can give it. Maybe we can infer that having one of them gives you higher likelihood of having the disease apparently, or it's connected or associated, but we just don't want to say that right away because we need to do like more experiments as well. Um, but, but like, as well to definitely say something is causal but here rather than being specific we're just going to do two-sided because we just want to detect if there's a difference if you want you can also be more specific but in this case we just want to see um, if there is indeed some association we, we, don't, we don't have any hypothesis right now about which one would give you a higher chance of having the disease so here, according to Wikipedia, right, so the Cochrane Armitage test for trends, so we just here we're calling it the Armitage test. Um, so it's named by William Cochrane and Peter Armitage. It's using categorical data when we're trying to figure out if there is an association between a variable with two categories. So here we have a variable with two categories and an ordinary variable with K categories. So it modifies the Pearson chi-square test to incorporate a suspected ordering in the effects of, of the K categories of the second variable. So for example, doses of treatment can be ordered as low, medium, and high. And here we may suspect that the treatment benefit cannot become smaller as the dose increase. So this test is often used as a genotype based test for case control genetic association studies. So the way that you interpret this is that, like as I was mentioning, maybe it's possible that in our case, that if we were to look, um, like let's say we look here at, at CC, CG, and then GG, like let's say we think that G has some sort of link. So number of G would be
the number of g will be here zero it'll be one here and then two and then we're looking at this there's a probability how does the pro as we move across here as you move in this direction what happens to the probability of the disease how does it change as we are getting uh, additional um you know, G alleles, does this increase? Does that go down? How is that affected? That's what we're looking at. So again, what I want you guys to see is that uh, we're just looking at how this probability is changing as we're going across and uh, where we are like, getting more um, of these. And, and again, this should, be a, a, this should be a little bit better. F is C, C. And that's a CG and that's a GG. So we're just seeing how does this probability, uh, you know, net probability, how does it change basically as we're getting more of the, um, you know, um, G alleles. So the number of Gs is increasing and there's a probability of disease given this genotype, does it change? So this is, I, I should probably write this a little bit clearer, like this is probability of disease given What's the probability of disease given number of G alleles? Does that tend to change? That's what we're looking at over here. So we could see like this would be like the case status, like, you know, being um, disease, this could be the control status. And then here, this could be like the number of G alleles, so zero, one, and two. So that's what we have to look at. And conversely, like it's, it's the same thing as us trying to look at the number of Cs and say that this is two, one, zero. It's just that the trend will be like going down in the opposite direction, for instance. So um, the, the way you would see it is, is there some sort of a relationship here between the number of Gs, the number of Gs from 0, 1, and 2, and again, those correspond here to like the, um, those correspond to 2. To, to this here. And we're trying to figure out the probability of the disease. And maybe it's going to be like, it could be linear, maybe like maybe this, 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 this does seem to be like some sort of a connection here or, or that we're trying to detect. This is what our alternative will say that there is some linear trend. But what the um, what the null hypothesis is saying, it's the, these yellow points are saying that there's actually, actually, let me make it orange. It's saying, oh, there's no connection, you know, if you have, whether or not you have it, there's really no connection at all between, this is what the null is saying. The null is like, is this? And maybe the alternative is saying that there could be some sort of a connection. That's what we're trying to determine. So again, from that table, what we typically do is what we're trying to find is that this could be like one number, second number, second, a third number. And what where we have this overall statistic where R is equal to um, R1 is N11 plus N12 plus N13. This is our R1. And then our C1 is just taking this um, first column here. So our R1 is this part here. And this is what our R1 is, is giving us. And then our C1 is giving us all those values and so on. Then to find this trend T statistic, this Armitage statistic, you basically, you carry out this formula, which we will explain where we have a set of weights. Um, and then what we are figuring out is that the difference between like N1i minus n2i given r r1 it's a difference between these after we rating the rows to have the same total so the null hypothesis is that there's no association that means that given whichever b is like if you're in um if you have like a certain dose it doesn't matter the probability that a equals one is the same as the probability that um you know a equals one given that b equals one should be the same as the probability that A equals 1 given that B equals 2, same as the probability A equals 1 given that B equals 3. So literally, it does not matter 
like what um, this is. And here B we could think of as like B equals like the number of, um, oh gosh, one second. So B could be like the number of G alleles. And then this could be um, the way that you could think of this is like this could be like case is is this part here. And then this part here below is the A equals two could be the control. So that's what we're, we're trying to figure out. So sort of following this example, we can find then the variance of this overall statistic. Then when we plug this in, we have this Z score. This would be our, our standard normal value. And um, that's what this is going to be, our Z test statistic. And we're going to hope that it follows a standard normal distribution with a mean of zero. And then one, two, three, the standard deviations are given in this direction. So it's a it's symmetric around the axis, negative one, negative two, and then negative three. And it's symmetric around, you know, zero. So that's the sort of distribution is going to follow. And then, um, you know, if we suspect a linear trend in the frequencies, then we should use these weights. Uh, that um, and the weights that we will give will be zero, one, and two for our t test statistics. So this is the weights that we will use. So let me sort of explain a little bit more again um, in this direction. So the trend test will have higher power than the chi-square test when the suspected trend is correct. So if there is indeed some sort of a linear um, relationship between the um, alleles, then the trend test will have a higher power. So it's a little bit stronger than saying that there is some association here. We're saying that there is a linear association that in some ways either having, uh, you know, we could look at the number of G alleles, so we could look at the number of C alleles. It's just going to be that, um, you know, whatever direction that things are going in. Look, we don't know because it's two-sided. All we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, well, what we're going to do is just, So we're just going to say that we could look at the number of we could look at number of G alleles as we're going across here. Uh, let me change the number of G alleles. And then that's what we would have here too number of G alleles, or we could go in the op, and then if let's say we we do observe like this trend in, in our data that, you know, the number of G alleles is increased is the probability of the disease. That's what this axis is saying. This is the probability of disease. It's usually like probability of disease given that we have like a number, a certain number of, you know, outcomes. That would be analogous to us almost saying, okay, well, uh, in this direction, like what if it's the same thing as us saying as we're going down, number of G alleles is the same thing as, no, so here the number of G alleles is increasing. And we could see this trend. It's the same thing as us saying, okay, well, let's instead look at the number of C alleles and then that is number of C. Could be increasing as we go the other direction but if we put it on our axis we would then put like if instead the um like maybe i should just have them analogous that's the same thing as us you know saying that it, if instead we want to measure it in terms of the number of c alleles maybe like we would then find the op exact opposite like mirror opposite where instead we will detect a, a downward trend you know, down in that direction. But if we were to see the number of G alleles, we would see something that goes up this way. That's what this that's what this part is saying. So it's analogous. It's, we're just trying to detect some linear trends. So we could look at the number of G alleles, or we could look at the number of C alleles. And for this part, like what we would have is we would have like GG, we would have CG, and CC. But for the one on the top, what we would have is we would have like um, we would have CC, 
C, G, and then G, G. That's how we would have those ordered. So it's just a matter of which one we choose. So we obtain, um, if we, there is some linear relationship, and that is true, we're not just testing some association, we're testing if it's a linear association. So if there is some sort of a connection, we should um, anticipate much stronger results that way in our result, um, you know, than the um, here. And, and typically, um, you know, in, in genetics, there are three possible genotypes at some locus, and it can be AA, lowercase a, lowercase a, one big A, one lowercase a, and two big A's. And then we can put these in a two by three contingency table. So the genotype frequencies vary linearly in the cases and are constant in the controls. So what we will find is the genotype frequencies will vary uh, linearly in the cases and are constant in the controls here. That means that here this genotype that we will find in the controls are typically um, the same, 20, 20, 20. So this is the constant part here that they're talking about and our constant in the controls. Let me use another color. And that's what this part here is saying that they're constant. Um, so yeah, let me, actually, let me just make that a little bit neater. Okay, so then that's what the that's a con constant in the controls and very linearly in the cases. So we see that as we're going from 10, 20, 30, we have the more of the giant A. So this is two lowercase, one big, uh, one big A, one little A, and two big A's. And we can see that the number of cases is increasing, everything else being constant. So this is the suspected mode of inheritance. So if we want to test if an allele is dominant over allele, then we could use 1, 1, 0 because here we, we are testing if um, a is dominant to um, little a is dominant to big a that's what this is that's what like we would use one one zero because that would mean that whether you have one um two big small a's or one big a your um you would still have the disease because if we think that giant a is recessive and lowercase a is dominant you just need to have one big and one little a, one little a for it to be um, inherited the disease. But if instead we think that lowercase a is, in, is recessive, we would need to use 0, 1, 1. So we would say that, okay, well, if, um, you know, like we, we need, we definitely need to have both of these alleles of lowercase a for it to be expressed. If we have even a single giant a, we're going to express the giant a if, if a is recessive. But if we think that they're co-dominant, like, and we also think that they both express each other in some ways, then we can just use 0, 1, 2, where um, having more of one phenotype gives you the, a different likelihood of the disease as well. And um, we often use this additive or co-dominant version of the test in genome-wide association studies. So we'll actually be giving, like, you know, this a weight of 0, this a weight of 1, and this a weight of 2. So that's what we often do. This a genome-wide association studies, the additive or co-dominant version is used where we have um, T equals 0, 1, and 2. That's locally optimal. So then also what usually, again, what I was trying to tell you is that we have like these groupings, like high, low, like high and low. We have some ordering of the uh, data and some scores. And then we typically uh, rank this as well with, what, with, with uh, some linear statistic is what we're trying to detect if there is some trend in the number of alleles and what we observe. You notice, like even for Alzheimer's, they say having the APOE2 allele, it could give you a much higher likelihood of actually observing the disease, for instance. Um, um, actually, in fact, like what um, the, uh, is an interesting example, which is really unfortunate as well, is that you know having the APO alleles increases your risk of Alzheimer's. So if you look on chromosome 19, there's this APO gene here at this location along this chromosome 19. It's an APO gene. And there are three different forms of it. There's APO2, um, um, APO4, um, which is here, and APO3. So it's APO2, APO3, and APO4. APO4 is really horrible, actually. Like, it really increases your risk of Alzheimer's. So you see here that you have these three different allele types. 
And if you have both of E2, E2, then it's extremely protective. Um, it, you know, you're 40% less likely to have Alzheimer's disease, um, you know, according to some data. Um, if you have Alzheimer's disease also is called um, AD. And if you have, so this is AD basically. So if you have um, in any allele of A2, E2, it's very, very protective. E3, E3 is like the average risk of having Alzheimer's disease is having both of these. And um, E3 alleles, it's the average risk. But you can see here, you're much less likely to have Alzheimer's. Here you're at the baseline in terms of the probability that you have Alzheimer's disease. And here you have an increased risk of Alzheimer's disease if you have E2, E4, um, E3, E4, and E4, E4 is a worse. So you can see that E2 gives you some protection where you're 2.6 times likelier, which is much smaller than 3.2 times likelier to have Alzheimer's disease. The E2 gives you a little bit of an edge over having an E3 here. But if you have E4, E4, you're 14.9 times likely. That is so much likelier because you have more of the E4, E4 alleles. So what we can see here is that there is indeed some sort of relationship and Alzheimer's disease, as you can see here, is in healthy brain. You know, he's young and, and healthy. Then uh, as he's, you know, getting into middle age, he's having mild, al mild Alzheimer's disease. You know, there's some, you know, neuronal loss and brain damage and neurodegeneration. And then as he's getting much older, then he's having severe Alzheimer's disease. So that's a healthy brain, and this is Alzheimer's brain. So your confusion with time or place, you have trouble following conversations, you have memory loss, trouble with familiar tasks, changes in mood or personality. You know, it's basically dementia, you know, very common cause of dementia, very unfortunate disease. And what they found is that apogene has, is a huge risk factor. So the number of E4 alleles greatly impacts your um, likelihood of having the disease. So there is some sort of a linear trend. Here it will be a little bit more complex because there are three alleles instead of two alleles, this E3, E4, and E2. So here there would be, um, so these three different alleles of E2, E3, and E4. And in terms of a star, you really want E2. And you'll be really unhappy to have E4 as an alleal. Okay, so that hopefully should be another example of disease risk related to the type number and types of alleles. So as the E4 count is increasing from here, it's like zero all the way up, you know, from, you know, one and one and then to two, your likelihood of having Alzheimer's really increases. So in the Cochrane Armitage test, the first step is to determine the weights to use. So since we're looking for a linear trend in the frequencies, and this is statistical genetics application, where, and we assume codominance, so we're just going to say that T is 0, 1, and 2. So these are what we're going to use here for our weights. Then in the next step, what we're going to do is look at this original table of our CC, CG, and GG, and we're just going to sum it up to have um, the total numbers for each group, you know. So what we'll just do is just, just, just add them up as well and say, okay, 28 plus 42 plus, plus 56 is equal to this. Um, and we just, we add these up along the way. And then we similarly, we also add up these values here. And then they should give us 143. And then we also sum across the column. So we will take this. and get 123 here. So that's how we will calculate the total groupings and figure out that we have 269 case um, disease and or control individuals in this study. Then what we will do is we're just going to take that same table as before and we're going to use this. So this is, remember from Wikipedia, they were shown that um, this is how you can break down this table. So we're just going to plug in these values here. So we're just going to say, okay, yeah, we're just going to basically just translate our table with, with what these values are and say this is the N11 is 28. So we're just taking our table and we're just assigning these so that we can use the formula properly. So N22 is, is 31, N23 is 17. So we're just like, you know, filling out what these values are based on the corresponding table that we had. So then
we can now follow this formula. And based on the formula, you know, for these three different situations for B, what we're going to use is this formula right here. So we have like our cases and controls, which is what A represents. And uh, we have these B. So if we have more alleles, we would change this from three. So this right here is representing the number of, usually um, we, we would just say this is the number. That's what this is. This is the number of B alleles that we have here. Oh, I'm the number of B groups, sorry, number of B. So it is based on the number of alleles that we have. And we just follow this formula here. And um, this is what it is. T1 times N11 times R2 minus N21 R times R1 uh, plus T2 times N12 R2 minus N22 R1 plus T3 times N13 R2 minus N23 times R1. So we then we plug in T1 equals zero here. And then we plug in T2 equals one over here and three, two, three, uh, T3 three equals two over here. And we just simplify this expression here in step four. So again, what we just do is we just like, I, I, I think this value here is here, this is here and for the, um, the T1. Then in the next step, um, we're just continuing on in step four and we're just like continuing to simplify and here we're just, so we derived this on the previous slide as well, um, this, this formula here, and we're just simplifying it some more and then we're just plugging in um, what these values are. So because this is zero, this whole thing gets knocked out. So we're just left with this expression here and we just simplify this out and um, you know just plugging in from this table here we're just plugging in values um, over here like you know n12 is 42 for instance um, let me use this that's 42 that is coming from here so we're plugging that in and then our r1 is um R2 is here, 143 we're getting here, which is coming from our R2 over here. We're just plugging in these values respectively. Then N1 and 22 is 31, which is here. Um, the R1 is 126, which we're getting here. So we're just plugging in those appropriate values and then we're simplifying it down to get our T test statistic is 13,832. That is so huge, actually. That's a really, like, a really like, like high number. So it's like really huge. So um, the next thing we're going to do is we're just going to calculate the variance of this Armitage test statistic using this formula here again, where this three is just the number of like what, what B is equal to. So if we have like more alleles, we would have like more of them as well. But um, here what we have is a variance of T is R1 times R2 over N. So here I'm just, you know, um, mapping the 126, which is R1 here, I'm just mapping that, that value here, R1, which is also the same thing. This also shows you again how, how I took the same table here and I've kind of translated it here where this disease is our A equals one. This is our A equals one. And this is our A equals two. And then what we are doing here is 126 is R1 here times 143. 143 is um is this part over here. And then the 269 is what this term is for N. Then we are just going to multiply this out. And um, what we will see here is for this variance, uh, I'm just going to focus in on this part over here and simplify it out. So what we have is this expression here. What is this expression exactly equal to? Well, like let's kind of see a bit as well. What is this exactly equal to? So um, 
like actually i could just say that this too um i have like this too i'm just keeping it out as well but i'm just saying that this is the whole expression here that we are focused on and we take the summation and we just keep on expanding out the summation here so um i equals one to, um you know j equals i plus one as well uh, of this term so we're focused on this one um, for i equals 1 and then we're focused on this for i equals 2 because you see i equals 1 to 2 so we take this outer summation here and that's what we are expanding on so this summation here is how I break it up with in terms of in terms of this part here and in terms of this part over here and that's where I get my i is equal to 2 and that's where I'm getting my i equals 1 over here. And I'm just simplifying it out a bit as well. So it depends on how you want to simplify it. I'm just walking through just in case you get a little bit tripped up on this. Because I know sometimes you can get people can get tripped up on how you simplify summations. So then what you do is you just like simplify this. And um, i equals 1 to j equals 2 to j equals 3 as well. This is the summation here. What this is essentially just saying is that this is j equals 3 to j equals 3. Since they are the same, it's just, you know, the same thing as, you know, as taking t2, t3. I can just essentially, like, get rid of the summation right here. I can just cross this out and just say, okay, well, let's just use j equals 3. And that's what this is really just saying, and i equals 2. Because the summation is j equals 3 to j equals 3. So let me just plug those values in, and that's what I will get. That's what I get over here. So then I just continue to simplify this, so I have just plugged that in. And then next I'm focused on this summation, and then I'm just saying, okay, i equals 1, a j equals 2, to j equals 3. So let me just, you know, add have the i equals 1 part here and j equals 2. And then here the j equals 3. Over. So this part is just for um, this part right here is just for j equals 1 and this part right here is just for no j equals 2 sorry this is j equals 2 and then this is j equals 3 that's what those are referring to right here j equals 2 and j equals 3 for the summation and then I just plug this part right here back into here so then I have what this expression is equal to and I'm going to take this part right here and I'm going to move it over here so then I have what this expression is as again this is what this part is referred to and I just plugged it in to find the variance of this test statistic t so here, like for t1 is 0, t2 equals 1, and 3t equals 2, again, this because it's a statistical genetics application but for codominance. So I just have this gigantic equation, and it's just a matter of me plugging in like all these terms over here from this table. Um, you know, so we, we've simplified this out from, you know, before I was showing you guys, and then we just are plugging in these values. So just please be careful when you're plugging in all these values in here. So just continuously simplifying it out. So you, you can pause the screen as needed for this. So um, the next thing is I'm just, you know, continuously simplifying it again, like some more, like this is just a next slide of me simplifying down some terms and uh, some more just breaking it down from the formula. Some more, and then eventually I come down to here, which is a rather high number for the variance. But again, remember our t was like in the 13,000. So this variance seems about like reasonable because, you know, reasonable scale. So the variance of t is about 3,364 um, and 74.5. So now, like once I have my variance set up of this t statistic, I can find the square root of this variance, which will be 1834.1413. Uh, and what the square root of variance is also known as is the standard deviation. So this is standard is equal to this. And this is also equal to our is also written like this. That's how standard deviation is. 
and variance is given by this is equal to the square of the variance. So now we have like a standard deviation and our variance that we've computed, which is a um, variance from before. Now we have a standard deviation, which is the square root of the variance, which is 1,834. So now what we can do is we can find what the Z test statistic is um, by using T over the square root of the variance of T, which should be a normal distribution with a mean of uh, a mu of zero and a variance of one, which is also the same because the variance and the standard deviation is the square root of the variance. The square root of one is one. So this is a standard normal distribution. So we take our, our T, which we found is 13,832, and then we divide that by our variance, the square root of our variance, which we found is 1,834. And then we get this really huge um, Z test statistic of 7.541404, 7 which is in the standard normal distribution here. So the way to interpret this is that you have this bell-shaped curve that's a normal distribution. Um, and it's centered with the mean in the center. And, with, and this is referred to as a standard deviation. Within one standard deviation, it's given by this green area over here. And within one standard deviation on each side, we expect to have 68.2% um, you know, of our data usually falls within one standard deviation of our mean. It follows a standard normal, you know, like a, uh, this bell-shaped curve. So we would expect to have like um, all of this um, within like uh, one standard deviation. But here within two standard deviations, what we really expect is that we would have like around 95.4% of our data would fall within two standard deviations. And then 99.97% uh, of our data should fall within three standard deviations. So we should expect like most of our data to fall within three standard deviations on either side of our data. So um, it's really custom to the, um, usually when you have a normal distribution, the way that it is, is your, um, you have normal distribution, um, which is given with a mean and then a standard deviation. And the way you find out what, what Z is, is Z is usually given by like X minus mu, the mean scaled by a standard deviation. That's how you usually find the Z value. So the Z value is taking this normal distribution and is scaling it by shifting everything over by the mean. So it's centered at zero and then just dividing by the standard deviation so that the standard deviation will just be um, equal to one. So um, that's what you are going to essentially do. And um, what the next important thing for you guys to do is um, So the next thing is to see that, OK, well, we have this formula here for X and I um, like, you know, for an X, a, a typical distribution of X um, would have this uh, if it's a normal variable here, like, you know, just some random variable. Like this would be the distribution of uh, for X, you know, like I'm writing it sort of in reverse. This would be like our distribution of our X. But then we're going to shift it to a Z, which will have this normal at zero comma one. That's what we would be looking for. And the way that we would find what that is, is we would just say that, OK, well, um, we are just going to, instead of having just three standard deviations and two and one, we're just going to have some formula that we can use where this is exactly minus three, minus two, minus one. So we can interpret what does Z score mean. The Z score sort of tells us the number of standard deviations that we are above the mean or if it's negative below the mean. And this is all symmetric as well. So here we have 7.541404, so this value is way out. So that means that we are about seven and a half standard deviations away from the mean. And what we're trying to find is the probability of us observing our Z value or something more extreme. So if Z is less than zero, what we look at is, is this the same thing as us saying the probability that Z, uh, our Z value would be less if Z, uh, then a certain number, then some, a certain negative value, um, which is the same thing as probability of us observing Z greater than some positive number. They're, they're exactly the same here. And that's what we're trying to say, like what is the probability of us observing like 7.54 or something more extreme for the Z value, um, if it's like one-sided or the probability of us observing negative um, 7.54 or more extreme. Since this is a two-sided test, we really don't care about the directionality 
here. So we're just going to add these up here. And that's what we're going to use because it's two sided. So what's the chance that we could observe something like so extreme that it's seven and a half standard deviations above the mean or seven and a half standard deviations below the mean, even though here our Z value is 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 above the mean. So that's showing that typically like we're in this direction, we're having more of the, the G alleles from zero, one and two. That's how our test was encoded where we gave this zero, we gave this one and we gave this two. So it seems that as you have more G alleles, the probability of you having the disease, it, it seems like it, but we're not going to say anything yet. But like what we can sort of take for future tests is that idea that maybe having more of the G alleles gives you some is connected and associated in some way, but that may not cause it with having a higher chance of having the disease. But again, that's not our test. Our test is just saying that it's linear. It can be going in the positive direction or it can go in the negative direction. So even if we can think that, um, so even if we can say that, oh, okay, I think I'm seeing this trend as we are having, like, as we're going from our CC to our CG to our GG, we can we can observe maybe that like it seems like the probability of this disease, uh, you know, type one diabetes, it seems like it's going up in this direction. We really cannot say that. For all we know, it could be going in this direction because that's not what our test is doing. We don't know, but we just say that there is some linear um, association. Even though, like in future tests, we could probably investigate that positive one because that's what we tend to observe. So that was that's a future follow-up study. But because this is two-sided, all we can really say is it can go up or down. There is some linear trend. Um, so that's right off the bat where we can sort of tell. But I'm going to talk in the next slides about how we also can interpret the z-score and get that probability. But such a value is in fact higher than um, what we typically expect from from our cutoffs for significance is usually um, if our z value is you know like more extreme than like this negative 1.96 or so 1.96 here or negative 1.96 sorry not to scale then our, our z value here so this is just showing how we have this x value here this is for the x and this is for our z um, and this is how we've mapped from our z to our x using this approach here but um so that we can interpret really easily what is what is our um but a z value allows us to quickly understand how many standard deviations we are above or below the mean for our data. So it's just a transformation that is easy to work with. So here again, what I mentioned is that um, we are looking here and this is how you typically look at a standard normal distribution. So the standard normal distribution is a Z um, distribution that has a mean zero and a variance of one, also known as a standard deviation of one because square root of one is also one. So what you can see is if you want to see for any Z um, value, what is the corresponding P value? Like you can look here, what this value is representing is this is negative 3.4 and then you tack on the nine. So this is like, it's almost like reading the amino acid dictionary to some extent that like this value here would be um, the, the probability here of, um, if you have a Z value of negative three, negative three, um, sorry, negative point four nine. And then, um, so pretty much it is symmetric. So if we find this probability here that, you know, of uh, what, what this represents is the probability of um, that our Z is less than negative 3.49 is equal to 0 0.0002. So that's what like how we interpret a given value. So we just take the negative 3.4 and then we tack on the 9 and that's what this value is essentially telling us. It's telling us this um, shaded probability here. Since it is symmetric, this probability is the same thing as um, it's the same is it's analogous to um, probability of Z being greater than 3.49 and they should be equal to each other because it's it's symmetric. It's a bell curve and, and it's symmetric around this mean of zero here. So again, like this, this value here would be like negative 2.58. That that's how you would interpret this. 
this would be like negative 2.58 is e z equals this. So if they just show you one of these, you can tell for the other one. But what we will find is that the z value that we got of 7.54, um, it's, it's, it's really off this chart, but we definitely know the probability of us observing that is going to be extremely, extremely small. And what, as I mentioned before, that the critical value is, is for 5% um, test, you know, alpha is 0.5. It's going to be 1.96. So what this is, is this is, if we're doing um, here, this value is what we're interested in. This is for 5%, like, you know, p-value threshold. I get it my handwriting, but that's what that refers to. Um, and then, you know, so that's how we can interpret a Z distribution, a standard normal. So this is a normal with these particular mean and vari variance because uh, what a normal distribution is typically given by is it's typically given by a mean. It can be anything and like, you know, uh, you can give it by the variance here um, or standard deviation. Be one, from one, you can get the other. But here, the, with the standard normal, we actually are like being very specific about what the mean and variance are of that, because we just want to have one one golden rule, one golden state slate, like one one formula, something that is easy to measure. Because this could be like twenty, and this could be like in either direction. We just want something that is easy to like, you know, like we just usually transform everything to this one common denominator, one common scale of the z distribution, and then we can use that. Uh, once we've derived all these formulas of how likely the probabilities are, we can just change the scale of our distribution. Like if it's not um, to make it a standard normal, just like scale it down, shift it over by the mean, scale it by the standard deviation to what we are looking for, and then look at this um, distribution either by a table, um, but here it's way off the grid, but we already know it's statistically significant because it's 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 more than seven. The 7.5 means it's like seven and a half standard deviations away from the mean. So the Z value here, um, the interpretation is nice because each each value is representing here. This negative 3.49 is saying that we're three and um, pretty much three and a half standard deviations below the mean. So our test statistic is saying that we are seven and a half standard deviations above the mean, which is extremely rare that we would observe that just by chance if the null is true. So we want to be realistic. If there's less than a 5% chance of that happening, given the null, we will then reject our null hypothesis because it's so rare. In fact, what we do find is that this p-value, if you look online, is that it's um, for this two-sided test, it's uh, 7.5414, it's less than, um, it is so, so small, it's it's, it's super significant for, um, for this two-sided test. You know, it's really significant because there's such a small probability of us observing the data that we got just by chance that there's no association. So the way we view it is we're trying to be reasonable. Um, if there is um, like, you know, if there's a 6% chance of observing the data, I'm given the null, then we're still going to be okay, you know? It's like, which threshold, you know, if it's 10%, still good, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, okay, now, okay, and that's in 5, no, 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 we're not, we're not okay with it. Like, we don't think the null is true anymore. Like, 6% is still, like, you know, if it's 6% chance, if it's true, we're still going to keep the null, like, we're very stubborn, right? But if it's less than 5% chance of this of, um, data coming just by chance that the null is true, we're like, okay, well, maybe something must be going on. Like, 5% is super rare. You know, if I flip a coin 100 times, 6 times I get heads, out of, and 94 times I get tails, I will still think, okay, nothing's wrong. It's still a fair coin. Maybe it's just... Maybe it's just, you know, the way that I'm flipping it or something else, you know, it's nothing's wrong with the coin. It's just luck, bad luck. But if I start to get 95, 96, okay, okay, okay. So it's less than 5%, 96. Okay, well, 96 times out of 100, I'm getting heads. This coin is definitely not fair, for instance. Um, so that means that, you know, it's really, it's like, you know, you're telling me it's less than a 5% chance of us getting this. I must be thinking something's going on. So that's how you can interpret what's going on here with the p-value. With the z statistic of 7.54, we effectively, the way that the plot is looking like is the following, that if we were to see our distribution, so I'm not really good at sketching, but like, um, 
but this should actually be like a bell curve so I'm just going to try to draw it more like a bell okay so like this is our at zero one two three okay three and then this would be analogous this would be like negative one negative two negative three so this is like this is the these are the z values here this is the z distribution but our value right here is like like 7.54 is is way out here it's such a small probability and this whole probability here will have to like add to one underneath it like I'll even even at these tails you know it just gets really really small and like you can think of the height you know this this whole area when you take of it is like the whole probability you know so it's super rare that we would find this value or something more extreme if the null is true so it it's definitely like such an extreme value that we really cannot like really refuse to ignore the fact that this that we have this data like it's such an extreme value like we, we try to find this probability this is the probability of us you know finding like a value like this or more extreme so it's two-sided so it's like the probability that you know we would find something like z you know being greater than 7.54 or probability of z which is the same thing as addition z is less than negative 7.54 so we're trying to see okay well how likely is it that we could even get this or is just replaced can be just the same thing as plus and that's what this is telling us that it's just such a small probability of us even getting something even this negative 7.54 would be right here or even getting you know this value or something more extreme it's so small like it's 4.64938 times 10 to the negative 14 it is super small we should be really careful like I think that we should reject the null hypothesis well yes we have finished this Cochrane Armitage test so we found a z's test statistic is 7.541404 since it's a two-sided test uh, we basically were looking here at um, this probability um, we were looking here at the probability of us getting it's really small negative 7.54 or more extreme the probability and also the symmetric probability here of negative or oh, x negative um uh, this is positive 7.54 and like we, we, we like so it's probably not to scale but as you see here like the mean is zero and that's like one two three um, so it's really not to scale, but we can see the probability of, you know, finding this Z value of less than negative 7.54 and positive, you know, 7.54. And what we found is we found that this um, P value is really, 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 really small. So it's 4.65 times 10 to the negative 14. It's less than 0.05. So we have evidence to reject the null hypothesis. It's not true. So there is a statistically strong evidence of a linear trend. Since this is two-sided, we can't really say right now that like it's increasing in the number of Gs or decreasing. So even though a hunch is now saying that it thinks that as you have more Gs, maybe there's a link. So that we would have to change it to a one-sided test. Um, but you know, there's always these things about maybe, you know, like you're seeing the results, you're peeking at it, then you're going back. Is that really ethical, you know? So maybe run some other follow-up tests with the data as well but you have some idea that there is a linear trend and you need to do more investigation so because our p-value is um, 4.65 times 10 to the negative 14 it's less than 0.05 here we have statistically significant evidence to reject our null hypothesis and instead accept our alternative hypothesis so we can conclude that there is statistically strong evidence of a linear trend the probability of the disease in population A is linear in the number of one of the alleles. So some genotypes are likely to have the disease than others. So what we can pretty much just say from these results is that like if we were to look here and see like CC, CG, and GG, 
we don't know what it is if the trend of the disease looks like this or like this e even though like we, we actually kind of can see that maybe um it might be like a hunch would tell us that it's probably this one that as we have more g alleles we seem like we're likely to have it like that's what our hunch would tell us but again it's two-sided so we couldn't like and again this is the probability of the disease so we just can't really just say that outright We can't really say that outright because we really like we, we conducted a two sided test. But um, so even though we think that it could be this, in reality, we just can't like conclude that we can just say that there is this one or this one. So it, it can just be either of the two, but there is some sort of a linear trend. It is not a flat line. It's definitely there is some linear trend going on and as we have number of alleles of going up. So, you know, if zero, one, two. So as we're increasing from 0, 1, and 2, or as we're decreasing, you know, if we were saying that we're counting the number of C alleles, this would be 2, 1, 0. In some case, that we see that there is some trend that's going on here. So if this, if you, if indeed the having more C alleles gave you higher chance of the disease, we would observe this. But instead, if giving, having more G alleles gives you a higher, uh, you know, is, is associated, sorry, associated with a higher likelihood of having the disease, you would expect this. And our data and I'm just like our intuition is suggesting that, if the, that since there's a linear trend, maybe it's in this direction, but we cannot conclude that because we were just conducting um, a two sided test. So that's all we can say is that there definitely is one of these two. It's not like there's no, no relationship, that this is indeed a locus for us to investigate. Sort of tying it in, what all of these steps are, you know, you can see all these like, you know, smileys from all the numbers from zero all the way to 10, you know, what, what are these again? So the first step is we are determining the weights to use. Since this is a genetics test, what we uh, typically are doing is we're just going to say that, um, you know, T1 is, is equal to zero, T2, and then T3, so T1. We can just say like, you know, T1, T2 equals 1, and T3 equals 3. Like that's what we're going to say. Then the next thing we're going to say is, okay, well, what are the total individuals in each of these groups, you know, and groups? So with 0, 1, and 3, so remember these are our B values as well. B, B equals 1, B equals 2, B equals 3. Like what are the total number of individuals you just seen you know, some across the columns and, and some across the rows and across the columns and you get those values and you just assign them uh, to the margin count you know sort of translating that wikipedia table into like the table where you you know the, just the formulas they just line up then you just use a formula to find the arbitrage test statistic t and then you also find the variance you know there's a lot of little math involved but you can follow my simplified formulas as well. Just make sure you also understand them or ask me questions as well. Please reach out um, if you have any questions. Um, please find the square root of the variance that will give you your standard deviation. Here, that's what standard deviation is. And then the Z statistic is um, just, you know, the Z statistic is basically the t divided by the standard deviation that we calculate here that is what our z statistic is um the t statistic that we found here divided by the standard deviation gives us what the z is and then we can find the associated p value for that z test statistic um, and that will give us the statistical significance of our results so sort of like tying in everything again, like what we were talking about from before is that we do DNA sequencing, we get all the DNA base positions. We see that uh, this guy's got like some difference over here of this G and G here. This um, girl here has this, you know, CC over here. And we're sort of figuring out, okay, well, is any of them like, are they sort of linked to our, our disease, um, you know, likelihood? So we have these people who are out of disease, you know, like this is the people who have the disease. We take their DNA sequences, you know, it's unfortunate. Then we have the healthy people that, you know, they, they got on life, they're happy, they're healthy. And then we take their DNA sequences and then we try to figure out like similar to this, are there like, like associations between spots in the genome? Like maybe this G spot here and the C spot here, like, is it something here, this um, 
as just some sort of a linking between this DNA sequencing, um, you know, for the case people and the control people here for the DNA sequences. Is there some sort of a spot in the genome where having, you know, where we could, we could there could be some association with, between why people have the disease, um, possibly some association and why other people are controlled. But we can't, again, say there's any causal effect because association does not imply causation. We need to do other tests. And there's also these all this whole branch of causal inference and, and things that you can say and not say. But we just want to find what spots could be associated. That's what genome-wide association study is trying to find spots in the genome that could be associated with the disease prevalence between why some people have the disease and why some people are healthy. Like we're trying to find those types of just spots that could be associated. And the SNP we were looking at with those um, genotypes of CC, GG, you know, CG, we were just trying to test out, you know, is there some sort of association there or not? And again, this is just an overall arching thing, you know, like we have a population, we have controls, they don't have the disease, we have cases. And we're trying to find like, um, you know, this trait we can use like SNPs, we can use all sorts of whole genome sequencing, and then we'd look for statistical association along the chromosome. These are like different SNPs and positions along the chromosomes, um, and log p-value of the significance. And then we try to perform linkage to sequilibrium as well, try to understand which, which um, genotypes, which alleles are linked to each other as well, uh, which could probably be like indicated or implicated with the disease of interest. And then we can look at like, you know, where those SNPs are, like the way those base pair changes are that tend to be associated with the disease. You know, is it areas of chromatin accessibility? Like, does that help control whether or not, you know, the DNA is wrapped around these histone proteins and maybe we can't access it, you know, it's, it's heterochromatin, it's hidden, or it's euchromatin, it's open to accessibility and transcription by the transcription factors. And that's also what epigenetics is, is that you have the same DNA, but, you know, it's nature versus nature. The nature is you have a certain set of DNA, but based on um, histone modifications as well that can be made and um, other chromatin accessibility, um, some DNA parts may or may not be read. And that's why even if you have the same DNA sequence, it's changes in the expression of certain genes that can also happen. Um, besides mutations, if you, even if the DNA sequence stays the same, it's just what the transcription factors are able to access. And usually it differs between different types of cells as well. That's why brain cells express um, brain-related genes like myelin a lot more than other types of genes in our body. So we can look for histone modifications, DNA methylation, transcription factor binding, conservation across different species. And this is EQTL, you know, quantitative trait loci as well. So there are different things we can try to characterize the functionality of these different SNPs, of these different variants, you know, the most common type of variants. We can try to characterize those um, as well and then perform experimental validation you know, using chromatin immunoprecipitation with an in vitro reporter uh, assay. So this is ChIP-seq. Then we can also like use in vivo models, which is this is using model organisms like mice to figure out, OK, at the SNP, like is this is there some association or not? And we can look at these variants as well. So um, that's what like APO happens to be a common um, some a variant large effect as well. It's more of an outlier, but we usually find that um, the more frequent an allele is, like evolution has given it a small effect so that we don't get wiped out if we have that disease giving trait. And um, these are highly penetrant mutations and they would have a high effect size. They, they, they really give us such a high likelihood of having the disease that we really want such low amounts of them. Otherwise, like evolution has, you know, natural selection, survival of the fittest. So this is all really cool. So we talked about Pearson's chi-squared in the previous video and now here about the Carquan Armitage test. And I really hope that this ties in the idea of sort of what we're testing for, what's going on. So please let me know if you have any questions. Again, my name is Sanya, and I'm always happy to help. Um, so yeah, please just reach out if you have any questions at all. I hope you guys have a wonderful day. Thank you, guys. Just ending with my logo.